Hi, I'd like to welcome you back to this week's lecture. I've uh, been actively watching your comments and everything you're doing on the discussion boards, and it's wonderful. I want to keep encouraging that. You're doing a wonderful job. Your essays this week were fabulous, and I'd also like to usher you in to this week's lecture on new media marketing ethics. So welcome back, and keep up the excellent work. So welcome to this week's lecture, New Media Marketing Ethics. And one of my favorite things about this lecture in particular is as soon as my words come out of my mouth, this lecture is already old. Uh, because of the changing nature of technology and how rapidly it moves forward and progresses, um, my lecture and even this debate that we will have today is already outdated. And I love that. It's always changing and it's ever evolving. So I've decided to begin this week's lecture with a short anecdote. So for those of you who have traveled a lot or who have traveled recently, you'll be able to relate to this. So let's say you're taking a trip to Hawaii. You need to relax. You want to go somewhere where you can put up your feet and get a tan with, say, a tropical drink in your hand. So how does the advertising world see you when you travel? Let's say you took a week-long trip to Hawaii. How much data has been collected about you? Who knows where you've been, who knows what you've done, and what souvenirs you bought your kids? So here are the questions. Did you check in on Facebook or Instagram? Did you check TripAdvisor to plan your trip? Did you use a credit card at the airport to buy a meal, perhaps? Did you use Google Maps to get around the island? Did you rent a car? Did you use a cell phone? So all these things that are now vacation norms are basically converted into data on you as a traveler. Now, collectively, this data can be used to advertise or to market to you, to sell things that you may want or are perceived to want, to recommend things to you that may be of interest to a person with your digital profile or your digital footprint. So my question to you is, in this newly emerging, ever-changing field of technology, as we just discussed, of big data, sales, what is ethical and what isn't? Do you have privacy as an individual anymore? And lastly, is your trip to Hawaii as simple and as whimsical as you had originally thought it was? So what information is available about you as a person online? So how many of you have a Facebook account? Have you posted photos of yourself or your family online? How many of you own a home? How many of you use location tagging or Google Maps to go places? All of these interactions with the internet comprise a data history called a digital footprint. Now compiled together, this information can be considered extremely valuable to, to advertisers and marketers as it tells them what type of consumer you are, and they can also deduce if you are the type of individual that would buy their product. Now this helps them spend their marketing dollars with more accuracy. But is the information you provide being used ethically by marketers like ourselves? Did you choose knowingly to have your information be used by Facebook to advertise products to you? And one other question would be how many of you have read, actually read the privacy policies for Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and other digital medias? Do you know what you're agreeing to when you sign up for those services? And furthermore, do you have a choice to not be online? How many of you applied for a job? Can you apply to a job in this day and age without having a presence on LinkedIn? Or if you've applied to a job, how many of you assume that they don't go and check your Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter page to see if you're a reputable person to hire? And if so, if all these are true, and if you've answered yes to all these things, do you have privacy anymore as an individual? So a little background. In proprietary software, like something like Microsoft Office, which we all use, um, an end user license agreement, or a EULA, E U L A, um, is a software license agreement or a contract between the licensor and a purchaser. Now, this establishes the purchaser's right to use the software, right, or your ability to type in Microsoft Word or create a PowerPoint deck in PowerPoint. Now, the license may define ways under which the copy can be used, the copy of the software, in addition to automatic rights of the buyer, including the first sale doctrine. Now, many forms of this contract, or the EULAs, are contained in digital form and only present a user as a click-through where the user must click accept. Now, how many of you, I'll ask you, have clicked accept blindly to using a software or to signing into Facebook? 
Did you read the terms and conditions? Did you read your contract fully through or did you just blindly click accept to something? Now, software companies often make special agreements with large businesses and government entities that actually include support contracts and specially drafted warranties. But what's interesting is, is what's actually in that contract. What are you agreeing to as an individual? Uh, what information, what data are you allowing them to see? Um, and they differ across the different media, specifically LinkedIn, specifically Facebook, specifically Twitter. What information are you giving them or agreeing to um, allow them to see? Um, and this actually originated with EULAs um, and with Microsoft way back when Microsoft Office was created. Um, so my question to you is, right, this may be a difference to your private Hawaiian getaway and it is likely an ethical decision made by businesses on how to use data to market or advertise to, but my main question is, do you know what you're agreeing to? Or do you just blindly click accept? So as we saw with EULAs and various software companies and various new medias, uh, the ethical use of new technologies is vital. It's very important, particularly in areas where technological advances have a significantly transforming effect on society. Now, every technological re revolution brings forth growing ethical problems. And as the social impact of technological revolutions grow, ethical problems almost always increase. So a few definitions are necessary, and you know I do love definitions. Um, and we'll go through a couple on, on the next slides. Um, now, all of these questions surrounding technology and new media advertising are actually part of an interdisciplinary research area called technoethics. So what is technoethics? Technoethics is, as I've discussed, an interdisciplinary research area concerned with all moral and ethical aspects of technology and society. It draws specifically on theories and methods from multiple knowledge domains, communications, uh, marketing and advertising as we're talking about here in this context. It also talks uh, with regard to the social sciences, uh, information studies, tech studies, and applied ethics and philosophy. So we're right under this same sphere of technoethics in this class. It works to provide insights on ethical dimensions of tech systems and practices for, as we see today, what we're living in today in advancing technological society. Now part and a lot of the techno-ethical debate right now is how to use big data. Now big data is a big term, a lot of you may be familiar with it, uh, but for those of you who are not, I'm gonna use this definition here in the context of how I uh, talk about that for the rest of the uh, lecture. Now big data is being generated by absolutely everything around us at all times. And every single digital process and social media exchange produces it. Systems, sensors, mobile devices all transmit it. When you walk into Target or walk out of Target, you, you go through sensors and they can tell if you're actually stealing the product. The same is true as if you go on a highway and they're watching you, they take, if you go on the fast track on the way to your UCLA classes, these sensors communicate data about your car or uh, where you are or your phone. Now big data is arriving from multiple sources at an alarming velocity, velocity, an alarming volume, and a huge variety. All through systems, sensors, mobile devices, all this stuff collects and collects and collects. Now to extract meaningful value from big data, you need processing power, analytics capabilities, and skills. And a lot of you have probably begun to work within the field of analytics as uh, if you work in digital marketing, uh, it's becoming ever the more vital. Now the amount of data and only depends, is only useful to marketers, uh, depending on how you use it. Um, and the internet and big data uproots huge ethical is issues of privacy and free speech. Uh, now free speech, for those of you who are not uh, native born uh, US citizens, is a fundamental US value, which is where the field of technoethics should become a very vital part of marketing and advertisers' vocabulary if you choose to market in the US. So let's talk about how advertisers and marketers specifically use big data. Now some of you may be doing this right now and are already familiar with the process of micro-targeting. So what is micro-targeting? Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I'll define it. Micro-targeting is the use by political parties and election campaigns of direct marketing data mining techniques that involve predictive market segmentation or cluster analysis. 
It is used by uh, U.S. Republican and Democratic political parties and candidates to track individual voters and identify potential supporters. They then use various means of communication, whether it be direct mail, phone calls, social media, email, etc., to communicate with voters, crafting messages to build support for fundraising, campaigns, volunteering, um, basically to influence uh, election day. Now, of course, big data enables micro-targeting. The more data you have on a person, the more you can actually hone in on a target to sway a vote. But today, micro-targeting has actually been socialized across our industry in marketing and advertising and is common practice for digital marketing and digital ads. So I'd like you to take a break from this lecture, push pause, and watch the attached video. Now located in your course module uh, for this week is a, a link to the attached video, and it's how uh, micro-targeting began through political campaigns. Now this video, video is now a bit dated because it's from the Obama's first election campaign, but nonetheless uh, it offers a history of how political uh, campaigns first began to use digital marketing in specific reference to digital media. So I'd like you to pause now and watch the video. Now, as soon as the success of the Obama micro-targeting campaign began to circulate, advertisers and marketers alike began to socialize his strategy and mainstream his tactics of micro-targeting to boost sales specifically. So I'll ask you this question. Are there ethical issues in acquiring personal information and using it to segment and market to the public in this way? Now, historically, micro-targeting was used to create personalized messages or offers and then deliver those offers directly to certain individuals. Then, this type of targeting was actually done using postal codes and geographical segmentation, which is part of, as we know, demographic marketing. Now, these personalized offers were targeted to a certain region where an audience would actually receive an offer customized to the characteristics of a socio-geographical region to which they belonged. Now, marketers can hone in on their targets even more precisely and target families and actually even individuals. And this is all based on, essentially, your digital footprint through social media and your web browsing history. So another definition. Cyberstalking is the use of the internet, and this definition is from Wikipedia, or electronic means to stalk or harass an individual, a group, or an organization. It can also include false accusations, defamation, etc. And it may also include monitoring, identity theft, threats, vandalism, solicitation, gathering information that can be used to threaten or harass. Now, having watched the video and understanding micro-targeting and hearing this definition of cyberstalking, I ask you this, is there a large difference? Is monitoring, gathering information, and then sending 10, 20, 50 emails an example of micro-targeting or stalking? Is there a fine line or a difference? If so, what is it? How do you regulate it? And I ask you this, between micro-targeting and cyber-stalking, if the only difference is the intent of the individual themselves, do you trust the individual who has your information? You may never have seen this person, but they have all of your information. Even if it's Google, even if it's the person who works at Facebook, these are people you've never met. Do you trust them with your information? Do you trust their ethics? So last definition, I promise. What is psychographic profiling? Now, a lot of you probably know it. You know the under and understand the difference between demographics and psychographics, but for those of you who don't, We've discussed the initial stages of micro-targeting as demographic profiling. Now let's discuss psychographics. Now psychographic profiling is the analysis of consumer lifestyles to create a detailed customer profile. Now market researchers conduct psychographic research by asking consumers to agree or disagree with activities, interests, opinions, statements. Now, the results of this exercise are combined with geographic, which is the place of work, demographic age, education, occupation, etc. And these characteristics are gathered to develop a more quote-unquote lifelike portrait of a targeted consumer segment or an individual. And that definition is from thebusinessdictionary.com. So let's return to our initial anecdote. Let's return to our trip to Hawaii. Now, if you took a trip to Hawaii or wherever, 
what does your psychographic profile look like? If you were to look at yourself from an advertiser's point of view, what products are you asking to be marketed? What type of market do you represent beyond the simple demographics of age, gender, marital status, etc.? Are your beliefs, feelings, opinions, are they off limits in your ethical point of view? Even if they aren't, they're being gathered. So I ask you this question. Do you think that micro-targeting and psychographic profiling are ethical? So whether you answered yes or no to that question on whether you think it's ethical, it's being done and has been for some time now. Now, data marketing's effects in campaign politics and elections um, and marketing and even criminal justice have been so influential that the Obama administration actually began a study in 2014 called Big Data, Seizing Opportunities, Preserving Values in order to investigate the ethics, the opportunities, and the limitations of big data's future. Now, seeing the value that micro-targeting and data actually offered his own campaign, Obama, our president, actually conducted his own still ongoing study on how these advances in technology can be used for national security purposes and SIGINT or signal intelligence purposes and what those things mean for American privacy and freedom, which we consider to be core American values. Now, why is this important? Now, if you think about Facebook, if you think about Instagram, if you think about digital media, um, a couple statistics. More than 500 million photos are uploaded and shared every single day, along with more than 200 hours of video every single minute. Now the volume of information that people create themselves, the full range of communications from all the voice calls, emails, and texts, to uploaded pictures, to videos, to music, all of this pales in comparison to the amount of digital information created about them every day. Now your psychographic profile or your digital footprint, what people can infer about you based on what you tell the internet. Now these trends continue. We are actually only in the very beginning of what Obama's report names the quote internet of things. Now this is a phrase now we're all familiar with. If you're not familiar with it, the internet of things defined here is where our appliances, vehicles, wearable tech, all of this stuff can, is able to actually communicate with one another. And since 2005, actual businesses have invested in hardware, software, talent like yourselves and services and this has actually increased by 50 percent since 2005 and they've invested up to four trillion dollars. Now your Hawaiian vacation seems a bit more complicated now doesn't it? Now many of you are likely familiar with the Arthur W. Page Society. Uh, for those of you who aren't, uh, the society is actually a professional organization that seeks to strengthen the management policy role of the chief PR officer in companies. Um, in 2007 and 2014, the society actually released a thought leadership study and also a survey uh, discussing the CEO's involvement in the digital world. Now, this survey actually um, investigated what ethics are at stake and um, ultimately what the role of the marketing uh, advisor and advertiser are in the future uh, with regard to digital media. And how does this affect the measurement, the transparency, and the overall corporate authenticity uh, which the marketer and the advertiser uh, often serve to protect. One quote from the study, uh, quote, the importance of CEOs to social media has con continued to grow and is no longer perceived as emerging. Social business is now an essential dimension of management. Conversely, the traditional no notion of message segmentation has continued to decline. Today, CEOs understand that there can be no walled off communications to particular constituencies. Everyone can see what everyone else is seeing." End quote. So what else did the study conclude? Uh, the conclusions for the study indicated an advanced need for uh, number one, new forms of measurement. Number two, greater speed. Just in general, the marketer and the advertiser need to be able to react faster. Greater enterprise transparency. If everyone can see what everyone else is seeing, we need to be more transparent as a company. New skills, uh, the concept of listening, social listening, listening to what people are saying about you became a skill set. Uh, if people can talk back to a company via social media, then you need to listen to it as a company or as a marketer. Uh, there was a shift in emphasis from defense to offense. 
to get ahead of the message, to get ahead of negative press. Uh, there was a sense of optimism about authenticity of firms, of people, and of reputations uh, because the consumer is more empowered. They have a voice now. Uh, there's more authenticity and there's more optimism as a result. And there's a desire for greater transparency. There's not the spin doctor anymore. People don't want the spin doctor. They want transparency. They want authenticity. Now, still considering the study, um, the study actually talked about how different expectations have changed. Uh, what are the expectations now? Uh, number one, social media is now mature. Stop talking about it as emerging. Uh, the news cycle is now irrelevant. It's 24-7. You're always on. Uh, the third one, reputation matters more. It can take years to build a reputation and only seconds now to ruin it. Uh, four, more CCOs are in the inner circle. Five, measurement is a key expectation. You have to be able to measure. You have to be able to understand that side of your brain as a marketer and a communicator now. Uh, there is only one message. Get broad and deep input before you do anything. And always make your values transparent, inside and out, financial forecasts, all of it. You have to be transparent as a company. You have to be ethical and check your work. All of these things relate to our class and our discussions about ethics. Um, it's making the corporation more ethical. And the digital revolution, the study actually concluded, has actually empowered every single individual to demand authenticity of all their enterprises and institutions that they follow, that they, that they buy things from. It is no longer possible to manage reputations and brands separately from our workforces and cultures. To be an authentic enterprise, these must be managed as one. And if you think about it, like let's say you take a, a flight on American Airlines and you have a terrible flight or the flight is delayed. If you go on social media, complain, it affects the reputation of the business directly. So American Airlines is forced to be a better company as a result or a more ethical one. Now that's because of the emergence of big data, social media and the enhanced power of the consumer to quote unquote talk back to corporations um, these corporations are forced to stand by their values. They're forced to be authentic and transparent. But has this been done at the expense, and let's return to us as the consumer, of the individual and their privacy? Is the corporation forced to be more ethical because they are watched more closely? If so, what backlash does this same effect have on individual privacy? So I'll leave you all with this question. How important is your personal privacy? How important is your personal privacy as a consumer, as an individual? Would you go back to the way things were before? Or can you even imagine going on a vacation now without Google Maps?